right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the David Ramsey Map Center. It's actually our first event of uh, the calendar year. So um, it's so nice to see a, a good crowd over here. Uh, uh, we uh, we're gonna, um, uh, before I uh, introduce uh, Ajay Andrews, I uh, just uh, housekeeping as usual. Um, uh, water in closed containers is fine and uh, the restrooms are, are, are downstairs, uh, second floor and all the way down. Um, so uh, uh, RJ Andrews has been here before. He is no stranger to the David Ramsey Map Center. He did a talk last year on Menards maps. And uh, since then, he's done a whole bunch of things, including a book. Um, uh, but RJ Andrews is a data storyteller. Uh, he's the author of the new book, Info We Trust, um, and uh, uh, a lavish adventure exploring how to inspire the world with data. Um, uh, I'm reading it right now, and it's fascinating. Um, RJ is the creator of Info We Trust, where you can enjoy many of his award-winning data stories. Uh, when he's not working on his own projects, uh, RJ studies the pre-modern history of data visualization and helps organizations solve information problems all over the world. Uh, so, without further ado, um, Info We Trust, How to Inspire the World with Data, Learn How to Make Maps, Charts, and Diagrams pe that People Can Believe uh, in with Data Storyteller, R.J. Andrews. So, uh, two and a half years ago, I was uh, actually at an event associated with this center, and after the event, I heard somebody say this, and I, I don't remember who said it, but it's kind of floated across the crowd into my ear and, and, and it, it caught my attention. And what they said was that Gothic cathedrals point toward Jerusalem, which, which is some sort of uh, you know, cartographic you know, statement. So I heard that and I thought that was incredible. I, I honestly, I didn't believe it, but it was so interesting, I wanted to know whether or not it was true. So what does it mean for a cathedral to point towards a place? Well, cathedrals orient their worshipers, right? A cathedral lives in a, is a, constructed in a cartographic reality and it faces their worshipers toward the altar. But it does not only face the worship or towards the altar, but also toward some, some destination. And so is that destination across Gothic cathedrals, Jerusalem? That's the question. So what do we do? We start gathering data. So we look at all of the uh, Gothic cathedrals in France. Why France? Well, we need some sort of limited sense. Gothic uh, architecture really takes on its own in France. And many of the famous Gothic cathedrals are indeed French. And so here we have uh, some of the earlier Gothic cathedrals uh, ordered by their date of construction because when they, uh, not date when they're finished, but when the construction began because that is the moment when the orientation is set. And so we can compare maybe their facades, we can compare their cruciform plans, get some sort of sense that these are different sizes, but also all part of the same thing. And so we assemble several dozen French Gothic cathedrals, and the first thing we like to do is we scatter them on a map, right? And we scatter them on the map, and then one by one, on OpenStreetMap, we go, and we measure the orientation of each cathedral. And here's Notre Dame de Paris, and we can see that Notre Dame de Paris orients its worshipers 25 degrees south of east, and we do that for each cathedral and we put on a scatter plot. And we have on the x-axis, on the horizontal, the moment, the year when the cathedral construction began. We have on the vertical axis, the orientation. And right away, this is very interesting because you can see that, well, everything, each cathedral points its worshipers somewhere between, you know, somewhere westward, or excuse me, somewhere eastward. Um, but there's, a, there's this big spray, and it doesn't seem like there's any particular pattern over time, and so we get rid of the, the temporal axis, and we collapse it down, and this suddenly becomes even more interesting. It's like, well, do we have enough to say that there's some sort of, some sort of pattern here? Maybe, let's, let's keep going. Of course, what does it mean to actually face toward Jerusalem if you're in France? Well, France is big enough that, it, well, it depends on where in France you are, and so, from France to Jerusalem, if you're in the north or south of France, a different, uh, a different bearing will get you toward Jerusalem. So we combine all this knowledge and make the map that answers our question. 
We have all the different cathedral orientations represented by these little, little uh, burnt orange arrows, and we have these golden arrows showing the direction towards Jerusalem. And this is a map, which is a map like some of Menard's maps, and that his maps, some of his maps have no numbers on them. There's no numbers on this map. But you can look at this map and you can tell that Gothic cathedrals in France do not point their worshipers towards Jerusalem. There's just too many arrows that have nothing to do with the direction towards Jerusalem. However, all the arrows do point towards the right. They do point eastward, and that's very interesting. So do Gothic cathedrals point toward Jerusalem? Again, not a statistical analysis, just using my eye, I say no. So what are they doing? So we go back to our distribution, and we add in another piece of information. And that is that the sun rises at a different point on the horizon every day, right? From solstice to solstice. And we can map the positions uh, on the horizon when the sun rises from the, the north of France all the way to south of France. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see it. Now we get something that I, I, I find really fascinating that almost every French Gothic cathedral orients its worshipers to sunrise on a particular day. Now, there are a couple outliers. And that's Chartres, and down here, and I know only the people in the front row can see this, but Le Mans is all the way down here. All right, so we'll get to the outliers in a minute. But once I saw this, and was able to uh, dig a little bit more into the research, I learned that Gothic cathedrals point worshipers towards the sunrise. Now, the sunrise changes every day. They point worshipers towards sunrise on a day that was particularly significant to the cathedral. Right? Now, this day was often uh, a saint's feast day. This seems insane to me. You know, how did, they, how did they orient the cathedral in a certain way in the town? Then you realize, well, actually, the town is built around the cathedral. Um, how did they know how to do this? Well, actually, they, they, they would stay up all night, and when the sun rose, they would mark the spot, and they would lay down the form, and then, and then start to outline the cathedral. It's a cartographic reality that's incredible, that even if you were standing in Notre Dame, right in front of the cathedral, you would never appreciate. Only once you see all of it together does it really click. This, is a, um, this isn't data storytelling so much as it is data exploration, um, seeing things using data. Oh yeah, those outliers. So we have Metz, Chartres, and Le Mans. So these are all cathedrals that are built on the ruins of earlier churches. So before the Gothic age, it wasn't fashionable to face worshipers towards the sunrise on a particular feast day. And so these, uh, these uh, are sort of grandfathered in, right? Or maybe since they're cathedrals, they're grandmothered in. So we have this slide. And I hope you think it's interesting. I, I find it fascinating. But really, if I started with this slide and tried to explain it to you, I, I don't think you'd, you might understand it, but I, I don't think it would be as interesting. You know, it's interesting to you because I brought you along on the cartoon version of the exploration that I went on myself. And so as a data storyteller, where we are in the process is actually sort of right here. You know, I've done this this visual, expansive investigation, and I found something that's very, very interesting. And it's so interesting, I want to put the work in now to take all of that and focus the story to my audience's eye. And we have done a lot of visual exploration. So we started with a, with a pure diagram. We looked at dots on a map. We also used an abstract statistical chart, and we used Different, different sort of blends of these. So we have a, a, a diagrammatic map, a, uh, a maybe a thematic map, and some sort of diagrammatic chart as well. And so as I'm thinking about what can we learn from all these different investigations that can help create a data story that is interesting to the audience, a story that not only uh, not only attracts attention and engages the audience, but then sustains their attention. In, in short, sort of what goes in the middle. 
So this is a cartoon example of what I do. My name's RJ, I'm a data storyteller. I'm based uh, up the road in San Francisco. Um, this is the billboard for the, the book, Info We Trust, How to Inspire the World with Data. Um, it is uh, packed with 300 hand-drawn illustrations in the same style of the cathedral story. The cathedral story uh, is one that is in the book. So as a data storyteller, um, I make maps, I make charts, I make diagrams. A lot of my work is very pictorial, uh, like uh, this piece that won uh, AAA Science Award for Best Data Storyteller, uh, Best Data Story of the Year. Um, so it is, um, it is titled, uh, you know, are, are gazelles endangered or not? And it's like, well, the question is like, well, which gazelle are you talking about? Because there's a lot of species of gazelle. And so here you have not only the silhouettes of the different uh, gazelle species, but you, you get to know like what, what level of endangered species status is each species? Is their population decreasing? Um, is it stable? Um, some of the work, um, again, another pictorial chart. So this is uh, every flower at uh, Jefferson's Monticello, so 212 blooms, and it's a cyclical calendar that repeats and repeats and repeats, and the flower uh, pops onto the screen uh, when it blooms and it stays on for as, as long as it blooms throughout the, throughout the calendar year. Um, this piece was inspired uh, immediately after I moved to California and I took my first trip to Yosemite. And I, I stood in Yosemite and I looked at around and like, this valley is enormous, right? It is, it is, it is. And my reference was Zion. I love Zion. I've been to Zion many times before I first went to Yosemite. Like, this is wider than Zion. This is taller than Zion. But am I at the same elevation? How much wider? How much taller? And so this is a frame from a short film I made about the national parks in celebration of its centennial of the National Park Service. And this was the one frame from that film, which is the point of inspiration, which is this is the thing I wanted to see. And so often as a data storyteller, what I'm driven forward by is my, is my, my need to see something. I really, wanna, I really wanna see something for myself. And like, well, if, if you took a cross-sectional profile of Yosemite and Zion and, and, and put it you know, with the, the same sea level reference, how would they look compared to one another? And sure enough, you can see how much bigger Yosemite uh, you know, with Half Dome is um, compared, to, compared to Zion. So that's a little uh, short introduction to some of my data stories. Um, I want to focus a little bit today on my relationship of my practice and the data stories I create today and how important the history of, of uh, cartography and data visualization and using uh, resources like the David Rumsey Map Center uh, is to my work. And so when we think about data, one way of thinking about data is that data is a record of the past. Data is just a shadow of what has come before. Data is, uh, frankly, data is just a fancy word for saying history. And history has two eyes, right? Um, one eye is space, cartography. We are really good friends with this eye, you know, in this room. And so when we're thinking through this eye, when we're seeing through this eye, we're looking at maps like this. But history has another eye. It's not just where things happened, right? It's also when things happened. And so the other eye of history opens up, and we can take that same sort of grid and then switch out the axes. And just like with the, just like with the cathedral story, we can see something um, that you, you couldn't really see in any other way. And you can bring something that sort of lives in our memory uh, only in, in this invisible world, and you can make it real, you can make it visible. That's the power of charts, that's the power of data visualization, to bring into the spatial world things that uh, formerly did not exist spatially. So this idea of the two eyes of history, this is a very old idea. Um, the sacred scroll of data visualization is uh, Dubor uh, um, Duborg's uh, machine. So this is the first modern timeline in 1753 as a commercial flop. Uh, I believe only uh, two of the machines exist, but each, uh, each panel is about 140 years of history, showing biography of over 4,000 people, and you can, you can crank, crank the scroll and uh, scroll through several thousand years of history. But Duborg wrote a great design essay when he introduced his machine. He says, chronology and geography are commonly called the eyes of history. 
Can't duration be imitated and represented as significantly, as distinctly as space? And so it's very important as somebody trying to represent invisibilia, like the orientation of cathedrals, like the rise of population over time, to, to study cartography, to study maps, because maps show us different ways that we can represent in, invisibilia. All right, so this is 1753. I want to uh, jump forward in time to just this past summer where we had the big anniversary um, of the Apollo, uh, Apollo 11 moon landing. And uh, if anybody uh, came in here early, uh, they, saw, uh, they saw this image up on the screen. I'm going to switch to a browser and actually take you through the story a little bit. So published this last July. It's called Neil and Buzz Go for a Walk. And this story, just like the Zion Yosemite story, was like I wanted to see what, what that comparison was. As the, as the moon landing anniversary was approaching, I realized I had really no idea what happened up there. I had this sense that you know, it had a rough landing. They took some pictures. Maybe they did some science, and they made it home safe. And I've seen a lot of maps of sort of how the Apollo uh, rocket system works and how long it took to get to the moon. But like, how long were they on the moon surface? What did they do there? What did actually they accomplish? How far did they explore? Like all these like basic human questions were completely lost on me. And so I made this data story, uh, and this is my first, this is my first uh, scrolly, scrolly teller or scrolly telling story. Um, and let's get the mouse on the right. There we go. Uh, so this is Neil and Buzz and Go for a Walk. And so, um, sorry, a lot, um, maybe only people in the front can see the bottom of the screen, but we're not going to spend too long here. So on the bottom, you have the Sea of Tranquility. Um, and what we have is just like a modern text message conversation. We have Neil and Buzz talking, Neil and Commander Red, and then Buzz Aldrin in, uh, in, in complimentary patriotic Blue. And so this is the real transcript. Now I've read the whole transcript, um, and it's, it's great. Like, go, go read the whole transcript. But the average person doesn't want to spend the several hours required to go read the whole transcript. So what I did is I pulled out the most interesting bits, right? The most salient pieces of uh, conversation between Neil, Buzz, Mike Collins, and, uh, and, and Houston. And I, I, what I did is, I pulled out the conversation that not only tells the story, but also the conversation that, that, that just exemplifies the humanness of the experience. Um, that really lets you see how giddy and excited and, and frankly, uh, professional you know, these astronauts were uh, in their first exploration. So yeah, so about ready to go down and get some moon rock. I mean, it's, it just, it's just wonderful. So I'm not going to read the whole conversation um, to you, but I, I did want to just kind of like show you a little bit of the data story. Um, and so we have this, you know, cartoon. Uh, Neil Armstrong is now uh, at the foot of the limb, um, about to step off, and then we have kind of a blown up version of that of that illustration. And each of the blown up illustrations, um, you know, on desktop, you know, you hover over it and you can see the original NASA media. Um, and so we have film. We also have some photography. Um, and so we go through, and then eventually, you know, Buzz is chattering back and forth. And of course, finally, Buzz comes out. And as I scroll through, and yeah, here we can all watch Buzz. You know, and of course, what's great is the Hasselblad camera. Um, for most of the mission, they actually traded it back and forth. There's one photo from the mission where uh, there's disagreement about who took it. Um, but for most of the mission, Neil had the camera, which means all the great photos are of Buzz. Um, OK, so we're going to keep going. And what I want to highlight now is not you know, the particular dialogue, which you know, again, you can kind of enjoy on your own. But then as you scroll through, you see this ghost trail emerge of kind of where they went on the moon surface. And then, oh yeah, here comes Michael Collins you know, orbiting above. Um, <laughs> And you can kind of see what, what uh, you know, them setting up, setting up the flag, um, taking the call from Nixon. It was very obvious kind of listening to, to the whole transcript. Like, 
how much a piece of propaganda was. You know, the saluting the flag and, and talking to Nixon and like, um, they only spent a little over two hours on the surface of the moon. Like, it was very, very short. Their time was incredibly, incredibly precious. Um, okay, so, you know, they're moving around. You know, people in the front rows can kind of see them moving around. Um, and then I'll highlight at the end, we go all the way to the last science experiment. Here is the unplanned Neil Armstrong jaunt. Does everybody know about this? So Armstrong, you know, the perfect professional, um, goes all the way out to this crater. He does it very quickly. Uh, we have the heart rate data, and you can see his heart rate actually spike when he does it. Nobody knows what he did out there. Nobody knows why he did that. Um, he lost a daughter, and so one of the leading theories is that he, he put a memento uh, to his daughter out there. Um, again, very human. And then, uh, and then by the end, and this is going to lift up so that, and I'm scrolling to the end so that at the end we can lift up there so everybody can see it. Um, and uh, the one piece that we didn't talk about is that the people in the front row, what they could see is that there's actually a timeline being built as we scrolled through. And so this is color-coded by who's talking um, and also sized by how long are they talking for. And you can kind of, you can kind of follow along almost as a, as a progress bar as Neil and Buzz go, go all over the moon. And again, one of the most human aspects of this story, which I'll highlight before we go back to the slides, is, um, is that they rested on the moon. You know, not very well. It took a, 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 until I think the third or fourth um, landing for them to figure out how to, for, to have the astronauts actually get a good night's sleep. But they had a makeshift hammock, and, um, and, and they both, uh, uh, you know, at least tried to get some shut-eye before, before they went back to Earth. So Neil and Buzz had a slumber party on the moon. Um, so, you know, it's a hand-illustrated piece. It's a, you know, there, it's an interactive web piece. Um, and so there's, you know, there's some arts and crafts, you know, involved with the piece. But really what the heart of the piece is, is it's a map, right? And so this is some, these are layers of a couple different USGS reference, reference maps. Um, and I'm, I'm building out, I'm using these to help select and build out the storyboard. And so what you see is not only um, astronaut paths of motion, but also each one of these lines is a photograph. And so I'm looking at every single photograph to understand exactly where they are, what are they doing, lining up some of those iconic scenes. So um, I spent a lot of my time doing, uh, you know, maybe what you could think of as design research. Um, so one piece I released several years ago um, is sort of this interactive timeline of, of 300 years worth of uh, information graphic milestones. And so each one of these icons you can click and see the real thing, um, you know, get, get a, a little story and then a source, you know, for whatever the best reference is, whether it's a High, high resolution image or a Wikipedia article or maybe um, you know, some PDF academic paper. So this is just a part of a lot of uh, essays and scholarship on, on some historic design, some modern design. I want to highlight a couple of things I published recently. So just a couple weeks ago I published um, this essay by Menard. And so um, you know, for, for just to remind everybody, Menard is responsible for creating, um, you know, many people's favorite infographic of all time. You know, he created that when he was 89 years old. When he was 80 years old, you know, almost a decade earlier, he published this. So in 1861, um, so graphic tables and figurative maps, um, it's a design essay. And it's a seven-page design essay with four plates and in the design essay, he explains how he came to do what he did, what mistakes he made early on, what influenced him, and uh, who copied him, right? And what kind of reception he got. Uh, it's an incredible design, design essay that is mostly you know, not known because it's in French. And so I worked. Um, I worked with, uh, with a French scholar, and together we've translated it into English so that 
uh, so that everybody can read Menard's own words and understand how he thought about his own work. But, you know, it's more than just his words, right? It's his beautiful maps. And so this is one of the four maps um, that's included in the work. Um, you know, Menard's literally another whole nother hour, uh, and we've done that. So I'm not going to spend too long on Menard's maps. But I just want to highlight one of the other great things about digital publication is that Menard writes a seven-page essay and publishes four plates. The plates are some of his own work and facsimiles he's made of other people's work that he really likes, that influenced him. So what else do, can you do with digital publication? Well, you can include his, the stuff he originally included, but then what I include is everything he references, I went and got the images. So for example, uh, this is Anselm Bray's anemograph. This is 1734, it's a machine. That, um, that actually outputs mechanically plots of wind strength, wind direction, you know, all using mechanical contraptions. And so you know, why not go take a photo of it and like, actually show it, right? And lots and lots of other pieces that aren't in the original essay but the Menard references, now we can see them um, right in line with his original text. Really great. So that's, that's one recent publication. Another is uh, deeply tied to the Rumsey Map Center. And so there is this monumental like, peak of thematic uh, mapping accomplishment in France. Um, and it's a program that goes from 1879 to 1906. Um, about 20, uh, rather 18 albums. We can see them. Here they are from davidrumsey.com. Every album de statistique graphique. And so each of these albums contains anywhere from a dozen to maybe, I think the, the biggest one has 34 thematic maps. It's an, a, a, it's an incredible cartographic accomplishment. Each of these books is about this big, and guess what? The maps, some of them are enormous. And what's incredible about them is that the French government pumped a lot of money into making these maps, so they're beautiful on their own right. But because they were produced for a couple dozen years, what you can see is you can see design evolve, you can see decisions change, and I conducted a study of these maps, a very specific study, um, over advent of this past year. And what I did is, and again, this is only possible because we have such great imaging of these maps, is you zoom way, way in, and you start looking at, how, at these different color palettes. And so here we have a beautiful diverging color palette. And so here's an image of the actual map, and then here's a digital recreation of the color palette. And so I did one of these every day for 25 days. And we're just going to go through a bunch of them. Nice group palette here. And now because we have uh, vector, digital, color patterns, these can actually be used in new maps. And they already have been. And so we're reviving these, this, these beautiful uh, French color palettes from 140 years ago. And, and you know, giving them life again. So again, uh, 25 new color palettes, all from the album de Statistique Graphique. Third essay I want to highlight from the website is a design interview. So um, I don't know if you know Fernando G. Baptista, but if you're a fan of any of the infographics in National Geographic from the past decade, it's likely um, it's likely because of him. And so. He is, um, he is a design, uh, a, no other way to say it, he is a design genius. Um, and his, I've seen his process, it's um, extraordinary. Um, what he does is he makes clay or plaster models of what he wants to do an infographic of. He takes them outside and he photographs them to get all this shadow reference. Then he starts illustrating his infographics. And it's a very, very uh, uh, artisan sort of situation. Anyway, National Geographic arrived and uh, with this infographic. It's a gatefold called Anatomy of a Giant, all about the giraffes. Um, again, my job today isn't, to, uh, isn't necessarily to um, explain the infographic to you, but just to tell you that this exists and it really turned me on. And so I reached out to, to, to the author and I said, will you tell me how you made this so I can share it? And show, so, of course, he gave me a great back and forth, 
explaining every step, explaining kind of what the vi original vision was and how it works and what the team was. But then he shared all these images, all these behind the scenes looks. And so you can see, you know, he's making models of, <laughs> of the giraffe, you know, interior anatomy um, and of the bones so that, so that he can photograph these and uh, uh, for, for his own illustration. You know, Natural Geographic is, you know, better resourced than some, uh, <laughs> you know, than some infographic design shops. And so here they are, the whole team, that's Fernando in the center, you know, actually going and visiting giraffes uh, at the zoo. Um, you know, you get these great kind of like, from concept to, to, uh, to the execution kind of stuff, um, and, and his beautiful illustrations. So, um, so yeah, so again, Fernando's work, the draft, it's, it's really uh, fantastic. You know, by this point, some people, you know, start to, start to question, this is all great, RJ, like, how do you have time to do all this stuff? And so, um, so I'll highlight one, uh, one project that, uh, that, that republished recently. Um, so we've been working on this for maybe five years. The Startup Cartography Project maps every, uh, every new business in America since 1988. Uh, over 30 million businesses geocoded, and I've been working on this with MIT and Columbia University um, since a publication in science in 2015. Okay, so what does the map look like? All right, so this is an interactive. This is, this is public, this is live. You can go, you can go see this right now. Um, the last time I gave this talk, I think I was at the World Trade Center, so sorry, but here, here we are. And Lower Manhattan, uh, believe me, like the Silicon Valley version of the map is uh, is is as interesting. Um, and so we have bubble size is number of new businesses. So you can imagine that big buildings have more than one new business every year. And then bubble color is quality of new business. And that's very interesting. Well, how do you how do you measure the quality of a new business? And that's that's uh, well, that's why we got into science because we figured out how you can say it. The time of businesses founding. How, uh, how high quality or not the business is. So there's a lot of practical um, car cartography that's going into this work. The most important of is, is the design insights. So making maps, bringing them into the field, talking to other researchers, talking to, uh, talking to policy folks all over the country and seeing what actually works, what helps them understand. Um, not in this, this talk, but I, I, I can assure you this, this this uh, color scheme has changed so many times. Not because I went into you know, some, some tower or cave and figured out the perfect color scheme, because I brought my colors out time and time and time again, and I learned how to do it better and better and better. So the map is totally interactive. Uh, it aggregates businesses at the state, metropolitan level, city, and address level. You can click on stuff. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So the last project uh, I think I want to talk to you about is a new one. And actually, nobody's, nobody's seen this yet. Um, it's called Cross Sections Through California. And there's a, there's a significant linkage between this project and, um, and the Zion Yosemite one we saw a glimpse of earlier. So it's, it's called Cross Sections Through California. And the very top of it uh, looks like this. So Cross Sections Through California. Here we are in Northern California, um, and you can see these elevation profiles similar to those national parks, you know, highlighting, you know, some of our some of our more famous peaks. Um, you know, what you'll notice is that, you know, north isn't straight up. And so, why do you do that? Well, you do that because this map isn't actually built for the screens. This map is built for paper. This map is meant to be printed, and California is such a weird shaped state that actually you need to rotate it to fit it on the rectangular sheet, right? And maybe we'll pass this around later. But for now, we'll look at it on the screen. So here's what it looks like. You have this interesting rotation. The other thing about the rotation is like as a Californian, like this is kind of how we think about the state. We think like the valley and the mountains go up and down, and we think that, you know, the ocean's kind of out, right? Um, and so we start up north where it's, you know, relatively temperate, and we go down. And what you see is that it's not only elevation profiles, but we're also using land cover data 
to show what's at each place in the state. And all of these profiles are very, very carefully tuned so that they cut right through you know, what I thought was uh, not only interesting stuff, but also cut through in a way that, they, that the profiles aren't clashing with each other too much. So a lot of design trade-offs to fit things on the map. So we'll keep going down and, uh, and, and finish it off all the way down. Um, and so here we have a nice, you know, you can see how exaggerated the vertical is. Um, you can, and then, you know, at the bottom you have to have the John Muir quote from Mountains of California. So a lot of data goes into, you know, a pictorial map like this. So here's the uh, multi-resolution land characteristics consortium uh, land cover data, most recent from 2016. Another fantastic map that really teaches you a lot about you know, what's happening where in California. And the USGS elevation data. And you can see how the elevation data, depending on you know, when, you're, when you're picking it up, how, how spiky and choppy it is. And so there's a lot of artistic sort of decisions being made about how much do we want to smooth things. But of course, because we're in the library, right, what's the historic reference? And so this actually has a very, very direct historic reference to isotype cartography. So the Isotype Institute, um, founded by uh, Otto and Marie Nurath, um, led by Marie Nurath through the 1940s, uh, created several beautiful cross-section maps. And I reference all of them with my design, but this one I reference most directly. This is cross-sections through the Soviet Union. And so this is a, a piece of what, uh, what we now know is, was essentially a piece of propaganda um, because the English, the English people that commissioned it from the Isotype Institute, it turned out they were spies. Of course, we didn't learn that until much later. Um, but we have you know, your same kind of cross-sectional profiles, um, pictorial symbols, um, a very poetic quote at the bottom, which I mirror with John Muir quote. So this is cross-sections through California on its side. Um, and I put it on its side so that you can see another reference, which is one of the things I do is, you know, whenever I do a new project is I, I basically check two archives. I check uh, National Geographic Archive to see what they've done on the, on the topic, and I check David Rumsey. And when I checked David Rumsey, I was so happy that I, that I wasn't the first one to rotate California. Because when you look across a lot of uh, highway maps, they rotate California in, in, order to, in order to fit them. So here's one from, uh, this is the earliest example I could find, automobile highway map of California, Western Nevada. You know, Western Nevada, why? Because California is such an odd shape, like you have to include it, I think, um, from 1917. So again, you're seeing it on a screen, um, but this isn't meant to be on a screen. It's meant to be printed and held and folded up and unfolded and enjoyed and seen again and again. So right now, I have a nice title block on it, but I'm going to do a little bit more work. So there's the interior of the map, but it has this exterior. And again, the exterior, because we do have a prop, you know, kind of looks like this. There's a lot of blank space. And so I see that blank canvas, and I get excited. I want to do something. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do more isotype uh, style charts on the back, and I'm going to do more abstract charts, one on uh, the people of California, one on California's agriculture, and I think one about California's uh, natural resources. And finally, I'm going to write a little design essay that sort of orients uh, you not only to the printed map that you're holding, but also, um, but also the history of its design. So if you want to get a map, um, I'm going to kickstart this soon. And if you go to infowetrust.com, um, the best place uh, to be updated and get you know, early access to the cheap version or whatever um, is probably through the newsletter. And so at infowetrust.com, um, you know, sign up for the newsletter. If you don't like signing up for newsletters, send me an email, rj at infowetrust.com. I'll make sure that you know all about it. Um, so that's the newest map. Um, but before we close, I want to give you just a taste, because we have a couple minutes before we go to questions, of where the cathedral story ended up. 
Um, and so the cathedral story, when we last left it, was right here, wondering what goes in the middle. And so once again, you know, I have a prop because this is also something that um, was designed to be held and designed to be explored on your own. And so here's the prop, which is the book. And this occurs near the end of the book. Um, it's sort of the big reward. It's the only full spread in the book. And so everybody who can't see the prop, this is roughly what it looks like. Now, before you know, reading anything or talking about the design or anything else, the big gimmick in this story is this. To read this story, you have to rotate the book, right? And so in order to engage with the story, what the story does to you is it orients you in the same way that the cathedral orients all of yours. It orients you to face on the compass eastward towards the sunrise. And so we can zoom in a little bit, you know, talk a little bit about what we're doing here. We have these uh, small pictorial, maybe pictorial multiples um, of mini maps. You know, you look at all the cathedrals in orange and how they're oriented. And I could have just used a solid orange bubble for each of these, but then you would have had to trust that I put the cathedral in the right place. You know, I show you the map and your eye immediately can see that, oh yeah, everything's lined up, everything's correct. You can see that distribution we saw earlier, right? You can see above, and I can remind you how the sun changes and sun moves throughout the year. And indeed, you can see that most, uh, most cathedrals do orient their worshipers towards the sun. Um, you know, as a designer, I don't think this is you know, a perfect design. I don't think this is the best design. You know, better design is always possible. But what's exciting always is figuring out you know, what, goes, what goes in the middle, what helps the data tell the best story possible. So again, I'm RJ. I think we have maybe 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Uh, if we want to talk, uh, if we want to do questions, if we don't want to do questions, then, uh, then I am happy to show more data stories. Uh, whatever, uh, whatever the audience wants. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions for RJ? Uh, thanks, this was fabulous. Uh, I'm curious how you decided to use uh, digital type and yet uh, draw all the other elements, because the drawing does add this wonderful sort of mm. softness and humanness, yeah. and and you mm -hmm. know I'm just curious why you made that cut yeah. off there. So, um, uh, do you mean for which project in particular? Well, like uh, when you did the graph, you have the uh, the numbers of the. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. Yes. Sort of yeah. So yeah, I'm. Um, so let's just let's just agree that. Yeah. So this has hand drawn. So this is hand lettered. Yeah. I didn't do the hand lettering. So my 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 colleague and friend Catherine Madden did the hand lettering here. Um, hand lettering takes a lot of work, um, and it's also my personal hand lettering is just not up to snuff. So when I'm able to collaborate with a professional hand letterer, I jump at that opportunity. But in reality, it's that's a real constraint to production. Um, many of a lot of what you saw is passion projects, and so you have to be very careful, kind of where you sink, sink your resources. Um, that said, what you're what you're um, bringing out, which is this idea of roughness, okay, hand handmade craft, okay, this is something that um, I'm engaged in, but I'm I'm certainly not the only one. So um, so yeah, all the illustrations in the book are hand drawn. Uh, the astronauts are, are hand drawn digitally, but still hand drawn. Um, and then, you know, even even the new map that you just saw, the cross sections through California. So, you know, all of these symbols are hand drawn, right? Um, and so, there's a certain um, and I talk about roughness. There's a whole chapter actually on roughness in the book. But one thing about roughness is that 
it's very obvious that there's a human connection and rough put making something by hand slows you down and it, it it forces you to really engage with the content in a way that just like whip, ripping off a script like doesn't um, and I believe that the audience um, feels that and a lot of people try to imitate roughness and I believe that that all those imitations of roughness, right? So like I have a, I have a pen tool that makes something looks like, like you have a photo app, and you take the photo app and you can, you can make a real photo look like it was like hand drawn, right? It was drawn with pencil or something. Like the problem with all of that is the variation comes from the machine. The variation doesn't come from a real person engaging with it. And so that variation isn't authentic. Um, so that, 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 that's one perspective on roughness, but yeah, it's something that, that I, 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 I delight in. Yeah, Wonderful. great, thank you. Hi, um, I was wondering, what are the audience you imagine for your stories? You think it's just the general public or some of your stories can also tell something to academics, meaning yeah. showing something that wasn't already known, maybe? through yeah. the graphical display. Yeah, so I think that, um, so, the, so I, I, I built, I built stories where the, the, the intended audience is many different types, including academics, and um, you know, I've contributed to several research papers across the year, you know, where, where you know, I mean, very typical is we need help explaining our thing. But it's actually more than just explaining the thing, it's like we actually need something that we can use to help attract attention to our work, right? And so academics are very often the audience. But honestly, like, when I think about how data stories excite me, I think about you know, being eight years old on my, on my bedroom floor, like, laying on my belly and like, looking at zoo books. And, and like, that's kind of like what I'm thinking about most often. It's like, can you make something that's, you know, that, that uh, attracts and appeals to a kid? And when I, when I get feedback you know, from parents and say, like, my kid wouldn't put it down, like, that, that's the best compliment you can get, yeah. Um. Thank you for a really inspiring talk. You know, it gives me about a million ideas. How do you decide what stories you want to tell? Mm. Yeah, so I think that's the most important, um, that's the mo most important thing is like, um, because there's, there, I have a list of maybe 50, 60 stories I want to tell, right? Uh, always, and I'm always adding to it and reordering it, and um, it's sort of, um, it, it has nothing to do with what you think is gonna hit, or what, uh, you know, what, what you think, um, you know, people wanna see. Like, they take so much work, it ha like the fire has to come from inside, um, because it takes so much work to bring anything across the finish line. Many of these stories will, um, will only survive long enough to satisfy my own curiosity. And so there's a version of this slide, which actually I made, and I made it like the day I got back from Yosemite. I pulled the elevation data, I made a simple chart, and I, I saw it. I made the comparison and it satisfied my own curiosity. But I was like, this is interesting enough for me to like bring it to, and like making that decision that actually, it, it's more than just a sketch for me, that it's something that I want to put out into the world, that's actually like the, a very, very, because once you, once you make that decision, y you've lost, you know, six to, you know, 18 months of your life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've, 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 I, one part of the discipline that I'm slowly becoming better at is making those decisions. <laughs> Um, you, you mentioned or you referenced early on this process of that it was an exploratory process you were undertaking, mm -hmm. I think specifically talking yes. about the cathedrals and, and I, your example just now with Yosemite and I think a lot of what you're talking about today, these seem like these, you know, you see, I want to see the thing mm -hmm. and so it's an exploratory yeah. data and visualization process, um, which I think is great and I do a lot of the same kinds of mm -hmm. things, but in, in my field of um, geospatial teaching, especially in, with um, geospatial educators who are teaching folks to go out and be GIS specialists mm -hmm. and these kinds of folks, there's, there's a lot of pushback I've noticed maybe in the past few years against this idea of exploratory, specifically exploratory map making, that you make maps to answer a specific question, not to throw a bunch of data down and you know, explore the data. I 
will say I disagree with. I think yeah. exploring data is a lot of fun. But what, where do you, what, what is your sort of view on that, that idea uh, of playing with data? So, so I mean, I, 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 I may not be completely up to date with, um, so uh, I, I, how many people work in academia? <laughs> okay, so academia has like a very particular, uh, very particular cultures associated not only ac academia generally, but also academia um, you know, across different fields, right? And they have c uh, cultures of communication. Um, why are figures at the back of the paper? Anybody know? Well, when you printed papers, like, and you made the, you made the graphics, like, you know, they're, you printed a different process and you had to tap them into the back of the paper. Like, and we're still stuck there, right? We're, we're still like anchored in this like, so um, you have to understand some of the culture. My response to anybody like, should we have, you know, should we do this or not? Like, yes, obviously you should do it. You should do more visualization in every way possible. Um, uh, you know, so John Tookie is, you know, the reference and, and sort of hero of many practicing um, data visual, data visualization um, people. And you know, the the power of visualization is is forcing you to notice something that you know you didn't expect, right? And um, you know, using maps to explore data, you know, hopefully brings something to your attention that 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 was unexpected. Um, so I, I, I'm all in for it. Another way, of, one is uh, exploration versus explanation. I also like just like seeing and showing, right? Like, you know, so sometimes it's a very private, and, and what's the main difference? Really, it's like seeing is just showing to yourself. And what's special about that is when, when you're showing things to yourself is that you know what context you have, right? Whereas when you're showing to others, you're making assumptions about what context they have, what context you need to deliver to them, how much of the narrative you have to like, you know, bring them up to speed. That's really the distinction. Thank you. Uh, you worked for uh, NASA and Raytheon. What kind of job did you work for NASA and Raytheon? And what, was it related to data stories? Uh, not, not directly, but I, I, I used a lot. So I worked as a, a, as a, a pure engineer for uh, you know, in in aerospace, and um, was very lucky to work at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, but I made visuals in both, um, and so you can think of you know, there's a lot of kind of ingredients, and you can pick out some breadcrumbs that like kind of lead lead to where I am now. Um, but one of them is engineering diagrams, um, engineering plans, 3D modeling. Um, you know, controlling you know several thousand part assemblies and you know, using visualization to do that, um, solving um, physics problems, uh, engineering statics and dynamics problems using diagrams. Right? There's um, you know, visual information is used in many many ways across across um, civilization. Right? And so there's a technical you know number aspect of engineering which is which is very influential and then you know there's also an aspect of engineering where you just have sort of the 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 uh, maybe discipline or like willingness to kind of like sit alone with a problem for many days you know on your own and figure something out and you know that sort of uh, that sort of mode is very helpful you know when you're you know figuring out how to get make buzz you know bounce down the ladder <laughs> How do you feel about uh, sort of thinking machine data software like Tableau, where I can plug my Excel mm -hmm. and immediately get yeah. some feedback that I can't get as easily from just looking at the data? Does that have a role in your work? Yeah. How do you feel so, about it generally? Uh, so I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to Washington D.C. next week, and as part of the arrangement is sort of I need to be only on their hardware, okay? And so they give me, give me your list, like what programs do you need? And I was like, this is a common talk when I talk to other practitioners, like what's your stack, what's your tool stack, right? And, um, and my flippant answer to that is always like the most important tool is a pencil and paper. Like that's, and then, and then, and then, you, and then you don't have to answer the question. But this, I actually had to answer the question because they needed to know what, what programs. And Tableau was certainly on the list of programs I wanted to use. So people publish incredibly beautiful, I intricate, interactive you know, things with Tableau. I don't do that. Um, but I do use Tableau to explore because I find um, Tableau versus something that I'm maybe a little bit less 
um, fluent in, like uh, our studio, because I'm a generalist, right? I, 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 I have a vision, and then I figure out what, I, what tools I need to accomplish the vision. Other people are like, they have a hammer, right? They're like, they're, they're uh, aficionados in like R or D3 or something, and, and they just like charge forward and make everything with that. I'm not that, so I'm a generalist. So, um, so for me, Tableau is very useful, especially for exploration and making simple charts and moving stuff around quickly and like figuring out is there something here or not. And then when I'm deciding whether or not to show it to people, I might you know, very often move out of Tableau. Yeah. I was wondering, there's a bit of responsibility in, or how you think about the responsibility in what you show. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of data and you can see a lot of things and then there's a choice being made. Mm -hmm. And some of these things, there's a responsibility of whose story you're gonna tell or what mm -hmm. sort of message you wanna say. Like, how do you think about that? Like, something that resonated with me was the people of California, what you're thinking about for one of those yeah. panels. Like, who are, like, mm -hmm. which people? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, so peoples of California, so, there, there's a, so I mean, so this is something I'm actively thinking about, right? So the question is, what you want to see with the peoples of California? So the Isotype Institute did a lot of phenomenal stuff looking at ethnicity of the world, and to our modern eye, it looks, um, but we don't appreciate it. It looks not racist, but it it, it doesn't look sensitive because of the uh, the way they visually represented different world cultures. Now, if you understand the historic context, what you realize they're doing is they're trying to show you that white people are a very small percentage of the world. There's many more Chinese people, there's many more Indian people. You know, again, this is circa 1945, 1946. So the historic context, you know, if you just lift the historic design and, 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 and reproduce it today, because you don't have the historic context, it's not gonna, it's not gonna register, it's not gonna work. It's also, you need a lot of color to kind of show off ethnic. I mean, how would you represent visually ethnicity today? I, I, I don't, I, the political climate is such a, it, I, I, it, it's so hard, you can't do it. And how do you do it without color? Because guess what? The star of this show is the map. Where is, oh here it is, is the map. And I'm only printing color here. The back is gonna be only black and white. Okay, so I don't wanna do anything with ethnicity. All right, so what else can you do? We can do gender. Because what what's, what's the best data resource we have? We have 1870 census, you know, up to 2010 census, right? And, you know, well, how does the census record gender? Well, now you're boxed into understanding how the census records gender, right? And so there's some data realities, and, but these are the questions that I'm asking my colleagues. Like, well, I'm thinking about doing this, I'm thinking about doing this. Like, this is very, very top of mind, and it's very, um, it's, not, it's not that it's hard, but you are very specific, and then these are the things that are driving forward the design, these, these types of questions. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, as a creative professional, um, how do you decide on your time allocation or what you would pursue when it comes to pursuing a passion project yeah. versus pursuing a project that's determined and already funded by a client versus yeah. like gaining new techniques. Like uh, what's your thought process? Yeah, I mean, so I think it's like, you know, it's kind of like the game of life. Like there's two simple rules. Like the, f the first rule is you know, there's always several projects happening at once. Passion, you know, other or, you know, professional, whatever. So a lot of stuff's kind of gray space in the middle. Um, and so hopefully the rule number one is work on whatever you want to. Like wherever your energy is, if you have enough stuff happening at once, then you can, you can and this is an efficiency kind of thing, but it's like, you know, if you're excited about working on that and you're able to go work on that. So that's rule number one, work on whatever you, you you're most excited to work on. Rule number two is if it's due now, you need to work on that one. <laughs> so that's, those are my two rules. <laughs> yeah. And if you're smart, then you're planning so that you're never working on something because you have to. Yeah. And try to avoid that. Enjoyed your talk immensely. Thanks. Um, I see your new book is available on Audible. Yeah. To what, e <laughs> to what extent do you think that would be an effective way to absorb the I, material, so which is I, highly visual? I, I was not part of that process. <laughs> I was not part of that process and I haven't listened to it myself. Um, that said, um, I, 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 so yeah, I mean you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get the visuals or anything else, but the book 
And you know, this was, I mean, Salim asked me to do this as a book talk, and you know, I didn't talk a lot about the book, but I will say um, the book is very, let's find a, a representative spread. OK, this is a good one. So, um, so the book, the book is, uh, has what's called like a triple narrative um, or multi-narrative in that um, the book has um, center black text, right? And that's narrative number one. It's actually written as a narrative. It pulls you through. Each sentence links up to the next. It's not a textbook, right? Like this is, this is a story that you read right through. Um, and then it has marginalia in blue on either side. And the marginalia is all these little pinpoints of inspiration and light that I found just so wonderful you know, across my career, across my research for the book. You know, things like Pierre Levasseur gives this, this, um, gives this address to the um, Royal Statistical Society's Jubilee Conference in 1885. And in his address, he describes bar charts as stacks of facts. And Levasseur's stacks of facts had to go into this book, right? But like, to weave it into the central narrative, it would have just, it, it didn't work. And so I just yeah, put that on the margin. You know, when I'm talking about bar charts, you have Levasseur's stacks of facts. So the blue marginalia is everywhere. Of course, the third, the third narrative is the visuals. And the three, the central black text, the blue marginalia, and the visuals, there's, there's a dialogue between them. And then, and that, but that dialogue is one that, as a reader, you get to sort of pick out. And hopefully, that's what creates all the meaning for you, is making the connections between those three narratives. Yeah, very interactive. How do you cope with the richness of uh, digital versus the book? Mm -hmm. um, clearly, you communicated a lot of things that I would think, not having looked at the book, mm -hmm. would be more difficult to communicate in a, in a book rather than on a screen. Yeah, so uh, not only speaking for me, but I think also other digital designers, is that we're all pretty fed up with designing for mobile. Um, you know, I mean, some of my some of my friends who are much more capable than, than than me at digital design and you know, just make some extraordinary work, is that we're, we're the effort required for the payoff for designing, particularly for mobile, is really frustrating. Um, you, there's this idea, and this was when um, I think it was uh, Joseph Priestley in his design essay when he publishes his timeline in 1760. 365. So he's talking about how this thing's so amazing because you can read my chart, and in the time that it would take you to read something in a week, read a book, you can spend an hour with my chart and get the same value. And what's important about that is that these visuals, just because you can look at them in five seconds, doesn't mean you're going to get all they have to offer in five seconds. The, you know, mobile design is really all about quick hits, right? And the problem with quick hits is that you can design for clarity. You know, a lot of modern design is all about clarity, 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 clarity. Like, hit them, right? And maps, we're surrounded by spectacular maps. A lot of them serve clarity. But what maps serve better than clarity is context, right? They orient you to kind of why something might be important. Um, and digital design, I think, is very much focused, and I think over-focused, um, over-rates clarity uh, in, in, in sacrifice to, to context. And so working on print publications is a luxury because you do get to, you do get to marinate a little bit more in, in that context. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm just a little curious about the, I guess, the name of your company, Info We Trust, yeah. um, and sort of how you see the relationship between kind of good design or visualizations and creating a sense of trust and information. Mm. And I think in relation to also what you were just saying about clarity and context, right. how trust falls into that. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a lot of design principles related to how do you build design. So you don't get to dictate trust. Right? Trust is something that is determined by the reader, by the viewer. Um, all you can do is you can offer something that is worthy of trust. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that you can do to you know, hopefully offer something that's worthy of trust. Um, I think you know, maybe one of the, you know, there's maybe a couple that could be used as sort of like a guiding light, but maybe the most important one is that you have to trust your audience. You, know, you have to approach them 
uh, approach your audience as someone um, who, who you know, is just as smart as you, just as intelligent as you, but just hasn't seen what you've already seen. And it's your job that you're going to show them something they haven't seen yet. Um, and so it starts with trusting the audience. And you know, there's, there's a lot of other things you can do. But trust, you know, when, I, when I named the website and started operating under Info We Trust, um, you know, it, was, it, was a punny, it was a punny title. Um, it was an available domain. You know, it was sort of like we were, we were kind of like frolicking, right? And like since then, like the word trust has become, and with information has become a, so yeah, like it was a good, it was a good bet, I guess, you know. Uh, two part question. Beyond National Geographic, what other publications do you think do the, the best job of visualization? And then the next question mm -hmm. is, have you, what do you think about visualization for political discourse yeah. to illuminate or does it likely devolve into the same where things go away, but could it be used to bring people together with a common picture of things? Uh, I think, I, uh, optimistically, I hope so. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it working effectively, uh, at least not yet. Um, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that that changes in the future. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of what to read, I mean, th there isn't a major newspaper that isn't pumping out great data storytelling right now. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I follow all of them and subscribe to a lot of them. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a data journalism. We should talk more, you know, about like who to follow because I follow everything. And so I'm sort of like, I'm like, I'm way out like underwater, you know? <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, I have to think about like what two or three should we, should we cherry pick? I think there's, there's yeah, one. Yeah, I was going to just add to that. Yeah. I think uh, the New York Times yeah. does a really good job. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they're very well, they're very, I mean, New York Times, you know, invested, I think, early in it. Yeah. Um, and sure enough, like their most popular stuff is their visual storytelling, right? That's what's getting the most eyeballs, and so that allowed them to, to reinvest. And um, yeah, one of the successful paywall newspapers. So yeah. yeah, yeah, New York Times is great. I mean, The Guardian's great. Uh, Financial Times, Economist, L.A. Times, Washington Post. Um, you know, Five Thirty Eight does some simple charts. It, it's just um, yeah. I mean. W w we have plenty of data journalism, but data journalism is only a very particular silo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate all your visuals. I find them really super compelling. I'm just curious if you have ever given any thought of to telling stories uh, with data to people with low vision or who can't see. Have you given any thought to how mm. to communicate the richness of the data yeah. in alternate media? Uh, so the latest, so there's, um, you know, I mean, Braille maps go back for forever, right? So that's, that's a whole, um, so let's say, so, so personally, the, the problem, not ch problem, the challenge is that you're drifting into situations where the, um, the production is, is, is significant, right? And so you need sort of to be connected with the right community and the right opportunity to invest in actually doing something like this. And so I personally haven't done anything like this. Um, what I want to do is that there's a whole subdomain called um, uh, data phys, like physical data visualization. Um, and so these are, you know, not only, you know, for maybe the, the cases you're mentioning, but also, you know, for like museum galleries and kind of stuff. And it's not just about like printing out something and hanging it on the wall. It's actually about building three-dimensional objects that, okay, so that's, that's one piece. Um, Data sonification is sort of an emerging, uh, emerging thing. I'm talking uh, in early April um, and doing like a two-part workshop, and, and my counterpart is um, is uh, is doing data data sonification. Um, and so, data sonification is a thing uh, in terms of actually like designing. Uh, I think there's a broader there's a broader uh, design sort of consideration that we could touch on, which is just impairments generally. And so in data visualization world, the impairment, you know, just like everybody 
hits on Menard's famous Napoleon march over and over. Everybody's like, color blindness, color blindness, color blindness, color blindness. And like, make sure you design with color blindness in mind. And we do, and that's important. Um, but it's only one of many visual impairments, right? Um, and so you have somebody that's you know designing for color blindness, but then has like really you know wispy thin gray text on a white background, right? And like nobody over you know a certain age is going to be able to read that. Um, and so there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different impairments that you have to have to consider, you know, beyond um, well the, yeah because you're trying to you're trying to make something that appeals to everyone, you know, is inaccessible to everyone, yeah. You know. One uh, time for one last question. Anybody? I think that's a good sign. Oh yeah, right. and if every, anybody wants, I don't know if anybody has a copy of the book, but I have. Um, I still have a little ink in the pen I used to illustrate the book <laughs> that I've been signing with for like the last year. So that's fun. And then also I have bookmarks if anybody wants a wants a bookmark. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Cool. Fantastic. Time.